From New York to our Bloomberg television and radio audiences worldwide, this is Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We're going to start today with the state of the economy. We got jobless name, claims numbers out today for the United States, indicating just how many Americans now are out of work. And we turn now to Michael McKees, our chief international policy and uh, economics reporter for Bloomberg. So, Michael, it was 4.4, more or less, more million Americans get out, 26 million in four weeks, and yet some people thought that was actually sort of better than it might have been. It is amazing, David. Six weeks ago, we were talking about jobless claims of about 216,000, and now we're talking about 4.4 million, and it seems like good news because we had 7 million for a couple of weeks in a row. It's just astounding. And with the number of jobs, uh, people filing for jobless claims, economists crunching the numbers, and we're looking at somewhere around 22 to 23 percent for an unemployment rate when we get those numbers on May 8th. And that compares with the high in the Great Depression, 1933, 24.9 percent. We could easily be above that. This week was the week uh, that is the reference week for the jobs report. So it may not be worse than that, but I mean, when, when you're grasping at straws for good news, global PMIs, uh, the United States comes in better than Europe with numbers that would have been astounding to anybody a month ago. Uh, 36.9 for manufacturing, 27 for services, the composite 27. And those are so much higher than Europe in France, the composite 11.2, the Eurozone, 13.5. You can't model the destruction of the economy with numbers that low because it's never been done before. We've never seen numbers that low. But the European Central Bank chief, uh, Christine Lagarde, today suggested we could see 15 percent uh, collapse in the European economy for the quarter. So the numbers that we're talking about are just absolutely astounding at those, this point. Now, those numbers that you're seeing there are quarterly numbers. They're not on an annualized basis as we do in the United States. In the United States, we're looking at uh, numbers like 30 to 40 percent because uh, we project it out over the course of a year, David. So, so, Mike, as you say, the numbers are just astounding wherever you turn, the United States or Europe. How much can we rely on the numbers? Because I've seen some reports, for example, the United States with respect to jobless claims, there's such an influx of people filing that some states can't keep up with it, and they're actually estimating. They may not be actual numbers for some states, such as, for example, Connecticut. That's why they think that we're going to see these kinds of numbers, the multi-million numbers of jobless claims filed for several weeks to come, because states have to work through the backlogs. Uh, we also have the issue of companies that have been trying to hang on with people on the payroll, do they fall off if those companies decide to give it up? So we may see uh, these numbers for quite some time, and that makes it hard to calculate what the overall impact is going to be. The other question is, how long does it last? When do people start to go back to work, and do we see the Paycheck Protection Program lure some people off of unemployment and onto payrolls again? Very hard to uh, guess what all this means, especially since the models never took anything like this into account. Yeah, models were not designed for this sort of phenomenon. Go back to Europe for a second that you mentioned with the PMIs and also Madame Lagarde's remarks about the GDP. Did those PMI numbers indicate anything about differences among countries? For example, Germany versus France. It shows that Germany was a little bit stronger, but that everybody has been affected. When you look at the German numbers, of course, the manufacturing powerhouse there, uh, their manufacturing number, 34.4, is not that far above France at 31.5. And those numbers seem a lot stronger than the service numbers. But that's because they count supplier delivery times lengthening as good news. Usually it means that uh, you can't get the parts because there's so much demand. Now <laughs> there's no demand at all, so there's no parts coming in. So supplier delivery times are infinite, and that means the numbers are a little bit higher than they even should be. But the southern nations, uh, which aren't represented in specific numbers today, but the overall European number uh, suggests that they're growing really, really slowly. And that's, going to, of course, going to be the big issue for the Eurogroup meeting this afternoon as the uh, leaders of the Eurozone try to figure out how to bail out those countries, how to keep their heads above water. An extraordinary story. Thank you so much for telling it. That's Mike McKee, our colleague at Bloomberg. And now for Bloomberg First Word News, we go to Mark Crumpton. 
Thank you. As you and Michael were just referencing, the numbers are staggering. In the last five weeks, 26.5 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits. Last week's total was 4.4 million. If everyone who asks for benefits is counted as unemployed, that could mean an April jobless rate of about 20 percent. Stay with Bloomberg. We'll continue to follow this story throughout the day. 100 meat inspectors at the U.S. Department of Agriculture have tested positive for the coronavirus as the illness ravages the nation's meat processing plants. The infections add to the growing concerns about the safety and the viability of the nation's meat supply after several major U.S. factories closed in recent weeks due to the outbreaks. France says it will lift its coronavirus lockdown countrywide on a case-by-case -case basis rather than region-by-region. -region. The government is working on a detailed plan to lift restrictions progressively on non-essential travel and revive its economy from May 11th, following weeks of confinement to prevent the coronavirus from spreading. The virus has killed more than 20,000 people in France. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Mark. Well, the world of investing and of investment banking has changed maybe forever. We're going to talk to the man who is right in the center of all of it. He is Ralph Schlossstein, who runs Evercore. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. We want to check on the markets right now with the stock market being at least mildly up. Abigail is here with all the good news. Abigail? Well, David, we do certainly have good news relative to stocks. The S&P 500 is up more than 1%. Where the bad news is in the disconnect to the stock market, the horrible jobless claims numbers that we had this morning, PMIs here in the U.S., stunning PMIs uh, in Europe. So the continued disconnect between stocks and this tragic, sad, real-world reality of the economy uh, collapsing. So it seems, at least in the near term, uh, continuing, presumably on the liquidity efforts of the Fed. Now, we do have a little bit of underperformance for the SOX, that chips index, up just half a percent. That could be an early tell and some jitters on the part of investors, given the fact that the SOX led on the way up out of March ahead of the S&P 500 uh, by a few days. And then you see some gains for Union Pacific up about 5.8 percent. They beat first quarter estimates. We did have the CEO on Bloomberg TV earlier. He did say volumes are down. Uh, by 25% for the second quarter, but a number of efforts to offset that. And then one of the darlings of working from home, David Citrix, this stock's into today had been up by uh, about 35% down today. They put up a good quarter, but the outlook not raised enough, enough, priced a little bit too much to perfection. And then finally, David, over the last four days right now, we could actually have a down week for the S&P 500. That, of course, comes on the heels of two huge up weeks, up more than 15 percent over the last two weeks. So this could be a bit of a cooling off for stock investors, David. Okay, thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Well, in a, a lifetime, a career really spent in the quarters of power, both in Washington and on Wall Street, Ralph Schlossstein has seen an awful lot, but I'm not sure he's seen quite the likes of what this reaction to the coronavirus has been. We welcome now the president and CEO of Evercore. He is Ralph Schlossstein. Thank you so much for being here, Ralph. And I guess my real question is, are we seeing a, a more permanent change or is this a temporary blip in your judgment about how this is affecting the economy and the business world? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, I think the, the damage is so unprecedented. Uh, as I think someone pointed out earlier, there have been 26 million uh, unemployment claims in the last five weeks. Uh, the highest that we ever had, even in the Great Recession, uh, was 700,000 in one week. So literally, this is... Uh, almost 10 times what we would have had if we had taken the, the, the five highest weeks uh, recorded in history. So the, the depth and the rapidity of this recession uh, is staggering. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, equally unprecedented 
reactions on the part of both uh, the fiscal authorities globally and certainly here in the United States uh, and central banks, uh, the monetary policy, uh, and particularly our Fed. Uh, so what the, the, what the market is really struggling with is, on the one hand, massive and unprecedented and rapid destruction uh, in the economy, the real economy, which is going to affect corporate earnings. And on the other hand, uh, trying to look through that and seeing, you know, two and a half trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus with the three stimulus uh, proposals or laws. Uh, and uh, that is also three times the stimulus that we had uh, in the Great Recession. And the monetary stimulus, uh, you know, the Fed started out buying a hundred billion dollars of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities a day, the most that they ever bought in a month uh, during the Great Recession was a hundred billion dollars. So in one day, they're doing what they did in one month uh, during the Great Recession. And so, you know, ultimately, the fiscal policy and the monetary policy will uh, mitigate the the depth of the downturn and it will uh, precipitate a recovery, uh, but we really just don't know how long that's going to take. How long it's going to take, Ralph, but also how much of a recovery? I mean, there's lots of talks about V's and W's and J's and U's and things like that. Do you think a year, two years from now, we'll be close to where we were a year ago? Uh, I think it's highly unlikely uh, that the the uh, ramp upward will be have the same slope as the ramp downward, and that's because, as I said, uh, you know we're we're dropping off a cliff uh, economically, uh, and you know unfortunately, uh, until the uh, economy starts to reopen, uh, these the stimulus will basically be a. a a tiding over. It's not really going to provide any uh, uh, stimulus for a recovery. You can't recover when all of, you know, so many of your small businesses are closed and when so many of your factories uh, are closed. So it will hopefully help sustain people who uh, are on unemployment and have lost their jobs, many of whom don't have uh, much money uh, to tide them from one week uh, to the next. Uh, but in terms uh, of getting the economy going again, uh, I'm confident that our recovery will be dramatically slower uh, than uh, the recession, the falling in the recession. We're talking with Ralph Schlossstein, the head of Evercore. Uh, so in the meantime, even as this all unfolds around us, we have investors who are trying to make investment decisions. We have CEOs that you advise regularly trying to make their decisions about where their company goes. In this new world, do you have to take into account what the government, whether it's fiscal or monetary, is likely to do, even more than what the economy or an individual company is going to do? Well, fiscal and monetary policy are an incredibly important input uh, at this point in time. Uh, they're an important input for some companies uh, uh, in terms of survival. Uh, do they have the access to cash? to uh, maintain uh, their operations and to, to stay out of uh, bankruptcy. Uh, and they're also important for companies who are in a stronger position, uh, but who rely on the aggregate level of demand. Uh, and we have, a, we have an economy which is 70% driven by the consumer. Uh, so uh, without a growing economy and a strong consumer, uh, even companies that are not as materially affected by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, still have to uh, look very carefully at economic policy and monetary policy. Let's talk about your business a bit, Ralph. I mean, you had your earnings statement recently, and you already had done some retrenching for some softness in the marketplace. How is this going to affect Evercore? Well, the, you know, our biggest business is... Uh, M and A, uh, and M and A relies basically on you know a number of conditions to be 
to behave normally. Uh, it relies on a uh, reasonably stable and well-valued stock market. It, re- it relies on high availability of credit. It relies on a reasonable uh, judgment or sense of where the economy is going, uh, and it relies on uh, CEO confidence. Uh, the last three are not present right now. Uh, there's not readily available credit. Uh, we have no idea uh, how the economy is going to evolve over the next six to 12 months. And as a consequence, CEO confidence is low. So our largest business, m and uh, is clearly going to be quite negatively uh, affected. Uh, the good news for us is that we've invested heavily in uh, businesses that help uh, where we can advise companies on their balance sheets, either in restructuring or advising the, them on debt or on equity capital raising. And so we're, uh, we're very busy, uh, even though we're spread out among 1,800 offices uh, around the globe. Uh, but, you know, the businesses that I just described aren't big enough uh, for us to offset what will be a, a pretty significant decline in M&A activity for sure. Well, if you look out, if you can, over the next 12, 18 months, do you expect that you will grow much more in things like advising on workouts, in restructurings, in dispositions, which one would think would grow to make up for at least a good part of the M&A? Do you, do you have the opportunity to grow into that part of the business? Yeah, those parts of our business are going more than flat out. and We're actually uh, repurposing some of our bankers to become uh, restructuring bankers and financing bankers uh, because it's the same uh, set of skills uh, in many circumstances. Uh, so no question, uh, those parts of our business are going flat out. They will grow very rapidly over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, they're not the same size as our M&A business. So overall, uh, they it's hard for them to make up for uh, what will be an inevitable decline in, in M&A. But by the way, if we do get a reasonably uh, rapid recovery uh, and and some uh, settling down, uh, it's quite possible that M&A activity will pick up uh, again, you know, six to nine months uh, from now. It will just require some visibility about the direction of the economy and settling down of markets uh, before that happens. We still have lots of active dialogue with our clients because there are many things that they still want to do. It's just, uh, you know, everybody is reluctant, that old phrase, you don't want to catch a falling knife. Uh, Do you expect that there will be as many bankers at Evercore and more broadly in investment banking two years from now as there was, again, one year ago? Uh, I do, actually. Uh, my guess is two or three years from now we'll have uh, more than we have uh, today because we've uh, you know, consistently taken market share. Uh, our business model of uh, independent advice without any conflicts with our clients uh, hugely resonates uh, with uh, both large and you know, uh, small and medium-sized uh, mid-cap companies. So uh, even this last quarter, uh, we once again gained uh, market share in the advisory business. Our advisory revenues were up uh, 10%, and the average of the five large uh, U.S. firms, uh, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, B of A, and Citi, was down 13%. Uh, so we're taking share uh, and in order to continue to take share, uh, you know, our only uh, input uh, to our revenues is people. Uh, and so we will continue to grow. And, and finally, Ralph, what about sectors? Do you see a difference in sectors among the companies you deal with? For example, right now, it seems like telecom is more needed than ever. Uh, online is needed more than ever. Uh, certainly the tech sector seems to be rising. Do you see as you deal with your clients that there's more openness, more confidence, more opportunity there than perhaps in some other more traditional areas such as manufacturing materials, things like that? Well, there, there, there are going to be a massive number of changes uh, in, our, uh, uh, 
in all in lots of sectors as a result of this. Uh, number one, we're all learning uh, that uh, we can be highly productive uh, without being all in the same uh, place. That has implications for uh, you know center city real estate. It has implications for, in my view, uh, family leave uh, uh, policies. Right. It had, so in the service sectors, uh, these are very these are going to be very meaningful changes in my view. In manufacturing, right. you're already right. seeing uh, rethinking of supply chains. Uh, do I really want to have one uh, supplier for a critical part uh, to my manufacturing process that comes from an area that could be uh, in fact uh, affected by a right. Uh, a pandemic. Uh, so uh, I think there are going to be massive changes. Yep. Clearly, technology uh, is right. inevitably going to be a continuing growing uh, proportion of the S&P 500, in my view. Right. right. Okay, Ralph, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to leave it there. That's Ralph Schlossstein. He's president and CEO of Evercore. And this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for our stock of the hour in his Las Vegas Sands up nicely on some speculation about reopening some economies. And Kaylee Lines, she's here with all the news. Yep, David, Las Vegas Sands is up more than 11% today. Now, it did report first quarter results that were by no means pretty. Revenue fell 50% in the quarter, but that was better than analysts anticipated. A lot of the weakness has been in Macau, 95% uh, drop in visitors in Macau over the course of the COVID-19 lockdown. That is a big chunk of their business, and of course, that weighed in the first quarter. The optimism today, though, coming in the fact that Las Vegas Sands sees a rebound coming in the summer as China lifts those travel restrictions and all that pent up demand comes flooding back. Now, of course, uh, JP Morgan, for example, upgraded the stock today. A lot of analysts agree with that idea that things are going to turn around in that major market. You're seeing stocks, the likes of Wynn Resorts, which also gets more than half its revenue from Macau, also rallying today. So a lot of optimism in the casino space as we do look to see these economies reopening. Now we turn from Macau to Las Vegas. Of course, Las Vegas, also a crucial market for many of these companies, and Las Vegas has yet to reopen. Much more coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The global economy is reeling from what's going on in response to that pandemic. At the same time, equity markets aren't reacting quite the way you might expect them to. We welcome now Catherine Mann. She is the chief global economist for Citi. Before that, she also served in the Council of Economic Advisors of the White House and was chief economist at the OECD. So, Catherine, thank you so very much for being with us. Really appreciate it. And let me pick up on exactly that point. Obviously, the economic numbers are terrible. We saw more unemployment today. The PMI is of Europe are terrible, and we probably haven't seen the worst of it yet. At the same time, equity markets, while down, are not down as much as one might think. Are the equity markets right that are properly assessing what the government's willing to do to save the economy, or are they underestimating the risk? Well, it's really good to be with you, David. Um, so I think that it, we can definitely see that uh, if we go back a little bit of a, a couple of months or a month or so, the the markets were were in free fall. The markets were absolutely in free fall until the Fed came in with its program, not the rate cuts, that didn't help, but with the, with the first round of alphabets uh, of backing. And then the markets still were uh, rep, you know, on the bottom until the, the fiscal authorities came in with their huge program. So it's no question that the equity markets are responding to the combination, the double-barreled Fed and monetary policy on uh, fiscal policy. On the other hand, you know, it's also the case that when we look at where they bounced back to, we sort of say, okay, they bounced back to where they were in the middle of 2019, maybe not to the highs of uh, the beginning of 2020. Middle of 2019, where do we think the economy is going to be in 12 months? Are they looking forward to that? Because if they're looking forward to that, 
they shouldn't be where they are now. And Catherine, one very interesting point that you've made is this. Everybody talks about, is it a V, is it a W, is it an L, is it a U, things like that. Your point, I believe, is it depends on where you look and specifically at what sector. It may be a different letter for different sectors. Yeah. So uh, a couple things. First, yeah, different letters for different sectors. Uh, and it's also different uh, letters depending on what your time horizon is. So let's talk about the sectors first. Something like a manufacturing, much more like a V-shape, because, you know, when the factory is shut down, you run down the inventories. When you have to ramp up, you have to ramp up production to make uh, back up your inventories. Maybe not as much. We are tempering the Vs a little bit because uh, the supply chain continuity matters. Uh, your factory may be open, but the next factory uh, on the supply chain may be closed. So, you know, you've got some tempering of the V-shape in manufacturing through uh, that relationship uh, and the fact that the whole world is not opening up at the same time because the virus didn't arrive at the same time. Uh, the other set of sector sectors, though, for example, are ones where consumer choice matters. Uh, we call it getting back to play, meaning people are uh, going out to entertainment, restaurants, sporting events, travel, tourism, of course, people in those sectors who are, oh, they are the workers in those sectors. They're the employed people. But it matters whether or not the, there is a consumer demand for those unstructured activities, things that you do by choice. Nobody's forcing you to go take a cruise. Uh, and so until that really gets back, uh, those sectors, the workers associated with those sectors, and therefore the economy as a whole, is going to have a drag. It's going to be L-shaped for them. And so you get these very different shapes depending on the sector. You add it all up to an economy, and you know some of them are a little bit more V-shaped because there's a little bit more manufacturing, a little more tech maybe, uh, and then other economies that might be a South Korea or a Taiwan. And then there are other economies that are extremely tourism-dependent, those are facing L's, uh, something like a Thailand, Singapore, UK. These are these are economies very dependent on consumer choice sectors. The other perspective, though, that I think is important to uh, remember is depending on what is your time horizon as an investor, if you are a very kind of a near-term, short-term time horizon, you're going to see these these just amazingly collapsing economies on a uh, quarterly, quarter to quarter basis. So into the second quarter for advanced economies for most of the emerging world, except for Asia, which is being changed uh, by China. Tremendous deterioration, but then huge rebounds in Q3 different for different parts of the world. So you can, there's a lot of arbitrage in there from quarter to quarter. On the other hand, uh, if you're kind of a long-term investor, if you're a long-term investor, you ask the question, when does the economy get back to the peak of economic activity as measured by, say, January 2020? How long does it take? Probably takes 12 to 18 months. It means for the economy as a whole, things are bad until you get to 20, uh, 2021, midway through 2021. So what does that mean to you as a corporation if I told you your revenues weren't going to be back to their peak for 18 months. You know, that's a pretty tough thing to be thinking about if you're a corporation. It, it is indeed, Catherine. One of the uh, remarkable things, certainly I never thought I'd see it in my lifetime, we saw this week was oil with futures contracts actually trading yeah. well into the negative numbers. It, was that specifically about some of the technicalities of trading in oil and having to take delivery, or was it indicating something more broad? And in, specifically, does it raise the specter of deflation? Good, good uh, set of questions there. So the, the, the negative numbers are a combination of, of technicality and real things, meaning where are you going to put it, where are you going to store it. Uh, if you can't find a place to store it and you've got a contract and you don't want to take delivery, then you're going to have to sell that contract, and that's how you get to negative numbers. But, of course, underpinning this is uh, over oversupply, you know, the tr price war and, and, and a lot of supply being generated um, by both Saudi Arabia and uh, Russia, as well as a lot of other producers. 
that supply is out there on the high seas uh, and uh, is going to arrive at ports in um, another month or so. So even uh, even when the production cutbacks that were agreed to uh, get implemented, there's still an awful lot of supply out there. There's also this question about whether or not the production cutbacks are going to be sufficiently um, significant enough to offset, which is a uh, you know a collapse in demand for for product. So it's a combination of the politics and policies about oil, uh, price war, and so forth, uh, uh, and the production associated with that, collapsing demand, and then the you know the technicality of there's no place to put it, and and I don't want to take delivery, so I got I got to sell, I got to sell. So that's the technicality of it. If anything, the oil markets probably are giving us a better read on prospects for the global economy, at least with regard to um, travel, tourism, and those factors that are important drivers of, of oil demand and, and other related product demand, whereas the equity markets uh, are giving us a view of how policy is backstopping them, so di- different degrees of backstop. All right. Catherine, finally, we're going to see hear from the central banks again, with the Fed, for example, next week, mm-hmm. and a series of other central banks. We've heard an awful lot from them already. They've done an awful lot to support the economy. Is there more to come? And if we essentially lapsed over to monetization of debt as a practical matter? Uh, well, the Fed has made it very clear that uh, they feel like they have um, as many instruments as they need, depending on uh, the situation. My guess is that uh, I think they knew that there was going to be this degree of, of fallout um, associated with uh, when you close down the services sector of your economy, and services, you know, account for uh, not uh, account for you know 70 percent of consumption, production, and employment. Not all services, uh, you know, shut down. Of course, yours didn't, and mine didn't, because you know here we are. But a good portion of the economy did. So they knew that it was going to happen, and, and they didn't want to have the financial fallout associated with that real side fallout to precipitate and create a downward spiral um, associated with you know a GFC 2.0. So they know uh, the degree of the of the challenge. Uh, they still have a lot of um, opportunities to to get involved in the various markets, the financial. Markets, bond markets, uh, through uh, basically everybody. Uh, you could call it a policy put on the entire portfolio, but that's exactly what had to had to happen uh, in the near term. So they have what they need uh, to do uh, uh, going forward. Um, whether they're going to come up with more programs, uh, I I doubt it at this point. Uh, I think they've got enough programs. They need to do the implementation. Okay, Catherine, really appreciate you being with us. That was terribly helpful. Catherine Mann is the Global Great. Chief Economist for City. And coming here up here next, we're going to talk with a congressman from, from Georgia, the state where the governor has said he's going to start opening up some businesses as of tomorrow. That's coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. But first, we're going to... Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We go now to Mark Crumpton because he's here with Bloomberg First Word News. David, Speaker Nancy Pelosi calls the latest aid plan before Congress an interim step. The House is expected today to approve the $484 billion bill already passed by the Senate. Pelosi tells Bloomberg TV that next she wants a major package of aid for state and local governments. That sets up a conflict with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. He wants the federal government to slow down and handing out money. A warning from European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde. She told EU leaders that the bloc's GDP could fall as much as 15 percent. Lagarde also told them they've done too little too late. European leaders are having a video conference. They're trying to figure out how to mitigate the economic fallout from the coronavirus outbreak. As many as half of the people killed by coronavirus in Europe were residents in long-term care facilities. 
That's according to the World Health Organization, which says the numbers show what it called a, quote, deeply troubling picture of the vulnerability of older people in care. The agency's European director also said today care facility workers are underpaid, under-equipped, and underprotected from infection. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Mark. So Georgia is going to open back up at least some of its businesses as of tomorrow, according to Governor Kemp. In the meantime, the House of Representatives is about to vote another $484 billion in spending to try to help the U.S. economy. And we're joined now, I'm delighted to say, by a congressman from Georgia, Republican Buddy Carter. He's back in Washington at the moment to vote, but we want to talk, start out thanking you, you for coming, but also asking you what's going on in Georgia. Do you agree with Governor Kemp's decision? Because President Trump seems to have some doubts about it. Well, certainly it's a difficult decision. Um, the governor is... Um I'm sure is is weighing a number of different things. The the facts that are being given to him, the, the the statistics that are being given to him, as well as the advice that he's getting from from his consultants. I'm sure that's uh, playing a big part in what uh, in his decision making. But you know, it's important to note that regardless of of the how rapid or how slow we roll out our economy, it, it, it remains incumbent upon the citizens to to do their part, and that is to make sure that you're following the guidelines of the coronavirus task force, washing your hands, make sure you're practicing social distancing. All of those things are very important. Just because the governor has given permission for many of these businesses to open doesn't necessarily mean you have to go. Uh, just because the gym's open doesn't mean you have to go to the gym. Just because the hair salon's open doesn't mean you have to go. My, my point is simple, and that is that a lot of this is up to the individuals, and when we do roll out the economy, and we are going to, and, and we're going to in Georgia tomorrow, very important that individuals do their part as well. Uh, we're talking about the guidelines from the Coronavirus Task Force, actually, they laid out those three phases, and one of them, as I understand, to get to the first phase, you had to have a decline in the number of instances and the number of deaths over a two-week period. Have you had it in Georgia? Because I believe you've not. So is the governor complying with the guidelines that President Trump set out? Well, and I think that's where the, the, the president was what he was alluding to yesterday is that the guidelines he called for some of the businesses that, that Governor Kemp has agreed to open tomorrow, such as the, the salons, such as the uh, tattoo parlors, that, the, that they would not open until phase two. And he's got them opening in phase one. So I think that's where the difference is, is the president uh, saying, I strongly disagree that ought to be in phase two instead of phase one. But, it, you know, again, keep in mind, the idea was that we, would, uh, that, that we would flatten the curve, that we would have our hospitals to be prepared and ready in case we do have a peak, in case we have a surge. And the governor feels very strongly that we uh, are prepared, that our hospitals are prepared, and that if we do have a peak or a surge, that uh, we can handle that peak and surge. Congressman, one of the big questions on everyone's mind is, as we start to open back up, will we know when we have a problem, how long will it take to find out? And that takes us back to testing. The bill that's coming up before the House to, to later today is going to include $25 billion for testing. Where is Georgia on testing? Are you confident that you have enough testing so that if, in fact, the governor did go a little too fast, you'll know about it fast enough to correct it? Well, that's a great question, and I will tell you that early on we were lacking in testing in the state of Georgia, particularly in my district, in the 1st Congressional District, which is the, the coast of Georgia. And that was something that really concerned me. Now, we have done better, and the reports from the hospitals in my district have been very good and very encouraging, saying that you know we've got a good supply of tests now. So I know that that was probably one of the – points that the governor took into consideration when he made this decision. And it's important because going forward, as, as we attack this, it's going to be, uh, we're going to have to take it in a twofold, uh, a twofold approach. And that is, first of all, it's got to be a combination of technology and intuitive technology that, that we've got to have robust testing. We, we've got to have that. If we see a surge, then perhaps it's time to pull the reins back a little bit. And I'm, I have enough confidence in the governor to know that um, if he has to reverse course, that he'll do that. 
And, and Congressman, let's come back to that bill that is pending in front of the House of Representatives. As I say, you've flown back, as I understand it, from Georgia, so you'll be present for the bill. Good for you. Uh, will you vote for it? And as important, is there a next round that's coming, which is assistance to the states? Yes, that's, um, that's a very important question. Yes, I do intend to vote for the bill today. It is, um, you know, essentially this bill is, this is not the fourth phase. This is, if you will, the phase 3.5. Uh, it's just the increasing the amount of money that's going to go to the payroll protection program, the PPP. The amount of money that's going to go to our hospitals, very important because it includes money for rural hospitals, which is very important in my district. And it includes money for testing, as you said, and also for the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program that the SBA administers. All of those are were part of the uh, of, of the CARES Act, the 3.0 Act. So this is nothing more than increasing the funding for those particular programs. Now, will there be a phase four, and what will it look like? Yes, I suspect there will be a phase four. My hope is that we will see how phase three does first before we jump to a phase four. There may even be a phase five for all I know. Will it include money for local and state governments? I, I think there'll be some lively debate on that, but, but yeah, we're, we're not going to leave our state and local governments hanging. We understand that, um, that they need help as well. Finally, just to wrap up on the effects of this new bill, the $484 billion, give us some sense in your district, the first district in Georgia, what this could mean for many of the small businesses down there. No question about it. We've been getting phone call after phone call from small businesses. They are really hurting. Keep in mind, I represent the entire coast of Georgia. Tourism is a big part of our economy, a, the, the biggest part of our economy on the coast. And the hoteliers, the restaurants, they have really been hurting through all this. Many of them, for whatever reason, didn't get the, the first round of the PPP. And, and making these extra funds available hopefully will – get that money to them because they vitally need it. Small businesses account for 90% of all the businesses in America. Over half the people employed in America are employed with small businesses. They are vital to our economy, and we've got to get this money to them. So I'm excited about having the opportunity to put more money toward a program that I think is going to save our small businesses. And you'll be there in person to help make sure it gets done. Thank you so much. That is Congressman Buddy Carter, a Republican of Georgia. And now on the way to break, there's some breaking news. The Financial Times is reporting that the first test of remdesivir, that we know that's that drug that President Trump has said could be an effective treatment. The first test has failed. And on that news, Gilead, which is the manufacturer of the drug, is down something like 6.2 percent, has, has been halted. And in fact, the S&P average overall is down. We'll continue to report on this as it develops. Once again, the FTD is reporting that the first test of remdesivir has failed. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Well, I spoke with Speaker Nancy Pelosi about that bill, that new spending bill that's pending in front of the House of Representatives today. But it's not just the economy that is going to look different with the coronavirus. We we'll also have to take a look at what's going to happen with voting. And she addressed specifically what she anticipates come November. I don't think anything that we're doing now should have anything political about it. Every bill that we have passed has been strongly bipartisan. Uh, as uh, three in March and then uh, this additional bill. And as we go forward, it'll be bipartisan as well. Uh, but one of the things that we want in the new bill is more funding to protect the integrity of our elections. Uh, as you saw, the Intelligence Committee, in a bipartisan way, released a report saying that without any question, uh, the investigation into the Russian interference into our elections uh, was uh, uh, substantiated. Uh, it was nonpartisan. It was based on fact. Uh, the uh, intelligence community tells us still the R Russians are 24-7 trying to disrupt our election again. So we want to protect the integrity of our critical infrastructure of elections. We also want to be able to have people vote by mail. This, at this, especially at a time of concern about health issues, uh, it's better for them to ha vote by mail to get their ballot sent to them at home, to have same-day registration for those who do want to go to the polls, but to have the, uh, the demand on poll watchers and the rest be much, much less. 
Uh, so we will be uh, seeking additional funds. We had $400 million in the first CARES Act. We need much more than that now uh, so that we can guarantee uh, the integrity of our elections. So we're talking about the lives of the American people, the livelihood of our economy, their livelihood and the strength of our economy, and uh, the integrity of our elections, the life of our democracy. Uh, this is very, very important. Now, more than ever, more important to be able to vote by mail. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi on what she sees coming ahead in November with those elections. And now we want to bring you an update now on Gilead. As we said earlier, it fell and was actually halted in trading shortly. It's a manufacturer of remdesivir. This is on a report out of the FT that its first test of that drug as a treatment for coronavirus failed. Now it is trading once again and is down about 1.6%. It seems to be fluctuating rather wildly. So we will continue to cover that story as it develops. That does it for Balance of Power on, tele on television right now. We're going to go over to radio in the second hour on radio. This is Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg.